What's up, Doc? It's Oscar Beckler. I'm here from the Seattle Blender user group for World Blender Meetup Day to talk about exquisite corpses. Now, first off, I wanted to share a little bit of info about Seabug, if you don't know about us. Seabug uh, is the Seattle Blender user group, and if you are in the Pacific Northwest, we'd love to have you. We meet at uh, Lake Washington Institute of Technology normally. Uh, we are going to have to, oh, let's just cancel this right here live and on air cancel this event because you know what a great time for world blender meetup day when we're all forced to be uh in quarantine so uh yeah seattle's gotten hit pretty hard and you know my thoughts are with all the blender users out there kind of going through the same thing in the real world so uh, it's nice to be here and talk about exquisite corpses now really fast uh what is an exquisite corpse uh sometimes you might have seen this where it's like one person starts a drawing and like if this was a page of a notebook you divide it into multiple parts and maybe the first person draws like a silly head here and then you fold this piece down and then the other person then draws like the mouth here and maybe they give it like I don't know, big old silly teeth and all you get to leave them is this little hint that something is coming down here. And now uh, somebody over here might make tentacles. That was probably a little too far. And so the philosophical idea here is that you are providing some jumping off point for your fellow artists to work off of. And so it's like a fun way to collaborate and work on a project together and always be like kind of surprised by the results. Uh, this exists in a lot of different mediums. Um, you know, I've heard about uh, the Beatles doing this for song lyrics or for like musical notation. Um, I've heard about it for, uh, it traditionally comes from poetry. The term was two words that didn't make sense and you throw a bunch of snipped up pieces of paper together, stick them together and you find something interesting. In animation, the idea is that where one frame ends, the next begins. And so uh, if I hand you an animation and you only see the last frame of it, you just start animating from that. And then when we stick them together, my animation flows into yours and it's seamless and it's really cool. And uh, the goal is um, just to have that starting and end point. Sometimes it's been, I've seen it done uh, where you hand the, like you show them the physical frame and they draw from that. And I remember doing this in college with a different mnemonic. Uh, I think we did it with a single dot. And so I started uh, trying to make one in Blender with circles. And I think I can show you an example of this. So this is partially from my upcoming book, which is uh, Blender 3D by Example, uh, second edition packed publishing with my uh, co-writer Zuri Greer, who's gonna be on later, I believe. And just to show you some examples of this, So this is one where it's like multiple scenes edited together. And like the goal is like they all start with this simple circle. So maybe it's an island and you zoom in and there's a fight. Another one is just a classic bouncing ball. Boop, 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 boop. This was a blender specific one. So in the book, you learn about grease pencil by going through these. And there's a couple other ones that I haven't really put out, but you know, maybe I will. Like, so this is one where uh, I, you know, I kind of am a believer in that, you know, grumpy old man logic of, sorry, I suddenly forgot how to use the camera. Uh, that grumpy old man logic that you have to, like, go to life drawing and do it all the time. So I actually run a life drawing group. And uh, I've kind of planned one out where maybe we could start with a circle and like have us go through the animation of it. Another example of this, some of these are just weird and probably not fit to publish, um, but I really like them. It's like this one's really gross. You know, it all starts with this simple ball and a lot of these are just, you know, it's a really nice way to have like a, a bite-sized evening, evening sized project where you just animate one thing. So I think this one is like, the circle turns out to be like a mermaid and then she just splits and it's fun to just do gross stuff like that for me 
so just to show you the one that I started working on for this demo we got this whoa, no problem. so this one is gonna have the circle start as like an embryo and just to lead you through the keyframe So it's just going to be a quick split, uh, split, and then suddenly it's a multicellular organism. Then suddenly it's going to be some sort of embryonic stage of some sort of hideous freak monster. And notice this strange looking shape. It's actually a W and it's going to be part of World Blender Meetup Day. It's written out here. And like you can, you know, my, my vision for this is that there's like cars going down here and you only need like two frames. And you just turn them on and off, or flip them back and forth, and then it looks like cars are trying to escape the city. Now, I wanted to talk about hardware really fast. Uh, I use two things. One is a Wacom tablet. Uh, I've seen them passively, aggressively write Wacom on their displays at cons. So, uh, I like how to pronounce it. So, I'm pretty sure that's accurate. Uh, I also use this, which is a Lenovo Yoga, and I really love this. Uh, one thing I wanted to recommend, if you ever try using a two-in-one laptop like a Windows Surface, let's see what I can get here. Uh, one thing is, there's just some quirks of the pen, and so when I use this, you uh, generally want to like hover your pen near the screen enough that the cursor shows up and that'll trigger some sort of code under the hood that says it's time for an action and then you can start grease penciling and it'll be this nice soft fall off if uh, you just dive in a lot of times it doesn't believe you and you get these like tiny strokes where it's almost like line weight zero or one permanently the other thing I was going to recommend is oh yeah. Uh, this is really uncomfortable to draw with. It's very unsketchbook like. And so I really recommend using portrait flip mode or portrait of hair. But now this has the same ergonomics as a sketchbook. And I think that's really, really nice. So I would highly recommend uh, trying that out and uh, try using grease pencil and vertical. And it has just a little bit more book feel to it. So with that said, let's like try and, uh, I don't know, what else was I going to talk about here? Uh, line preferences. Okay, so this is just something I wanted to you know, riff on about um, how you should draw when you're animating, in my opinion. Um, I mean, I you know vacillate between these from time to time. By the way, I should figure out how long I have. Yeah, this goes until it goes. Uh, but really fast, I guess we'll start drawing like a, a second letter here, some sort of disgusting B. And I really like using the draw ink brush with a stroke smoothness of around these settings. Uh, 0 0.05 is really good. And this gives you something where you'll get this like slight stickiness to it. So this needs to be some sort of horrible B. And you know there's various ways that you can ink and I think like in animation one thing I try to do a lot is animate in such a way that um, or draw in such a way that I can do it fast. And that sort of can change your ink style. So, for instance, like cross hatching, I don't do. Um, that, that sort of comic book style, I think, sometimes doesn't translate over. Because, for one thing, uh, it ends up becoming a rendering style where you probably need to save that for like the flats zone. I think I'm going to have them be like such a horrible giant mouth here. So, uh, 
along those lines, I also, a lot of times, you know, prefer doing this for my pencil test rather than using like a pencil layer and a pencil like brush. The reason being that, you know, you can kind of just erase it and I don't know. I usually find that um, if you're work if you're trying to get frames out, you gotta go fast. And so, like this is a mistake. What I just did there, like if this was pencil and paper, I would be tempted to uh, fill that mouth in with black by like just going like this. But that is not what I want to do. This color is not correct. So because like you're gonna end up using a flats pipeline, it tends to be a better choice to uh, I don't know, what's the term uh, ink in a way that is you know not rendering. So in other words, you're not trying to draw light and you're not trying to draw shadowing. And then also like you should think a little bit about um, let's give them like one gigantic. Uh, you want to be thinking about what's going to be something where the paint bucket bucket tool will come in and save you. So like, uh, I don't know. It just changes the way that you draw a little bit. You gotta make peace with that. So I wanna make sure that I get like some of the perspective here right first. By the way, let's talk about uh, that in, uh, for now, just cause you know, I wanna make sure we're on time. How long is this thing? I just realized that Open Broadcaster software doesn't give you like a timestamp. So regarding the background layer, I'll show you some of the tools that I really like. Uh, I currently don't think the default in Grease Pencil is to show the 3D cursor. And also I have my overlays off. But my 3D cursor is way over there. And uh, with just a tiny amount of um, perspective knowledge, you can get pretty far. So like this is technically kind of almost a one point perspective, but with a little bit of two point perspective. And you know, you really should just draw this and um, go crazy. So if I just create a new layer here, I'll throw this one away later. Uh, I like to turn on the guides and I've got my radial guide here. So if you set this to circular with the cursor as your point, you can get really rapid circles that follow the guide. And I like using radial to get pretty quick perspective. Um, so um, my bird's eye perspective is over there. And I also kind of technically have a one over here. So some of this I'm going to use with the guides. Like if I'm throwing in these buildings, maybe I'll actually have this be like some sort of secondary layer. And like this one is an example of where I broke the rules of this and just switched over to a more curve there. So you can switch over to the curve tool for that. And so, you know, you don't have to have perfect perspective. And I think there's a pretty wonderful artistic debate to be had about whether um, rigid perspective is uh, good or bad. But like, you know, especially like if you look at old, you know, some cartoons, uh, they're like really playing with shape language to get that, so like Dexter's Lab and stuff. Like as long as it conveys the idea of perspective is city, it's good enough. All right, sorry computer. 
So let's talk about how we can start doing something with this. And I'm going to start with some basic flats. And a flat, if you've never uh, heard the term before, is just this idea of something that demarcates sort of um, like an alpha channel of an object. So, that. so really, like the line art is part of my flats. I'm going to turn off. I'll turn off the background here too. So for the flats, like you know, I want to share my preference for how I do material design in grease pencil, which is really, really like kind of bare bones. Uh, what I like to do is I like a, to have a sketch layer that is one line and nothing else, and then I just have. A fill layer and I just give it a solid color and that's it those oftentimes are like my two materials for as long as I can stretch it and why do I do that because individual layers can use layer tints so a lot of times I'll just have this layer tinted to be like that sort of brownish creature color and I'll just fill it in like that uh, how do we get this guy filled in as fast as possible? Well, this layer's opacity doesn't have to be from these fill things. And that's good because a lot of times you end up with um, these frustrations when you're doing this. Demo effect. Hmm. I don't even know. Must be in the material, I guess. So yeah, a lot of times, what's the problem that you run into? Try and use the paint bucket tool. It doesn't work because you got all these line leaks. And I think you have to make peace with this because I actually really love these line leaks. I think there's a lot to be said with negative space where you just leave a little opening and like maybe it becomes a lost edge. And we don't need every single thing to be correct. So a lot of times what I prefer to do is with my brush set to nothing, just fill it in with like that, you know. The other thing is that a lot of like your uh, paint buckets um, decision making is actually going to be based on your current view. So if I zoom to this area and paint bucket, you'll notice it kind of got everything. So a lot of times, especially like if you're trying to fill everything except a shape, you can actually just hover like this and sort of figure it out. Now right now what I'm doing is trying to get this so that uh, this entire creature's monster form is filled in. And so I think the fastest way to do it is like that. I think there's another thing you can do which is the paint bucket tool. And how many of you guys do the blender thing where you know there's a hotkey, you just don't know what the hotkey is. So you just go through the list and you hold control and you try it and then it doesn't. So you hold alt and try it and it doesn't work. And then finally you hold shift and try it and it doesn't work. And like if you use enough graphics programs, it starts building up that they all have the same basic like kind of sort of UI. See, and this is where I just get like frustrated. So, why not? Like, why keep trying to plug those holes when instead you could just. Oh, 
like that. And then fix it separate one from another. But like, you know, there's nothing wrong with just like, actually like, you know the old, uh, the crayon logic that you use when you're a kid is you color on the lines as close as possible, so very, very neatly, and then you can rapidly flood fill. And I kind of like doing something that's similar, but the opposite, which is I know that this big old middle part, hell yeah, that's going to be in my flat. I don't know how yet, but it's definitely going to be. And somehow, by doing this, this all right so we got this guy flatted some of these things I don't worry too much about you can also go into this layer and up the stroke thickness. Pardon me. On this fill, you can give it a stroke. Uh, and then copy and paste that in. So now you can just use the stroke thickness as like a post process. Sort of blurt it out, right? Mm. Maybe one more, just this little toe. Alright, so now we have to think about our next flat. And what's nice is we can start using uh, layer masks. So I'm going to create a new layer. I'm going to call this mask uh, local color. And this mask, light. And, well, maybe I should call this shadow. But I wanted to really quick talk about what I mean by shadow before we just dive in. If I can just take a moment to draw with our trusty dusty draw pencil and the sketch material. So, a lot of times, what do I mean by uh, uh, shadow? A lot of times when you're rendering in uh, ink or uh, with physical materials. On one hand, you've got these separate ideas, right? Your core shadow right here, your cast shadow under it. And then maybe you get darker and darker uh, near areas that are like down here where you start getting contact shadows. Or as 3D people say, occlusion. And I want you to think about this, at least in my opinion. I think the way to think about your shadow layer is break it down to this basic concept. It's your cast shadow plus your core shadow. And uh, so we're not going to mess with opacity. We're not going to mess with building shadows up. It's not actually going to be very sophisticated. Instead, it's just going to be one quick idea for all of the shadows. And because of that, we can set this to multiply. So I want this on something where... I'm switching to the fill material and this first thing I put down is going to determine a lot of this which is which way is our lighting coming from and this button here I think, turns on clipping mask so for something like this a lot of this is going to be things that I like to erase at random 
I'm actually going to do some of this to start with. It's just a really big freaking brush. Do like that. So like right here, obviously we don't yet have the cast shadow down there, but that's an area where I can start going in like that. And now that I have something in there, we can start being a little more aggressive on this line layer. Let this be dark black. And I'm going to now work on the shadow layer only. So if you click this lock button here, it'll lock everything except that layer. Which means you can do things like sculpt. The light's kind of coming from up there. So something like this, I end up casting a shadow downward. See, like, uh, you end up with like multiple areas where you can end up controlling your opacity after this. On one hand, I can control it on the material. On the other hand, I can control it on the layer. But because this is on multiply, I could also do it um, by changing the color of the layer. And so if it's lighter, it'll multiply less, which is where a layer tint can solve all your problems. So this is where I think like using a big brush instead of um, instead of the fill tool is nice, which is um, if I'm using a big brush, a lot of this stuff can later on get erased away. And other parts can't. Like if I use the fill based method, sometimes it can't. So if it's something that's like really obviously big. I use the fill. I think I lost ten percent. Oh, I did. It only took me fifteen minutes to notice it. And now I can also add some local color. So I think like your fill layer can actually be the start of a local color. 
and that like if I make this a fill that's full tint, some sort of brown, average light. Now everything starts on that. So on this local color layer, this is where I'm going to start doing things where I might need different materials. Because I might want to have them all on one layer. So maybe I'll make one that's like, uh, that doesn't duplicate my fill at the time. So this should probably have like a dark green for like a snake back and a yellow. And then maybe some sort of purple accent. So on this dark yellow, yellow. Copy and paste that. Or on the dark green. I don't want that to be dark green. Do you remember where you were the first time you used Blender's hover copy and paste? Yeah. So, as an example of this, I can now on this local color layer, that's like the only thing I'm working on. I can add some sort of like nice snake belly here. I'll make it clip. I'll switch to the dark green. Yellow a little bit. I'm gonna turn the stroke off for it too. color for everything and how do you determine where things are so like grease pencil has a couple of things that determine z depth on one hand inside of a grease pencil object each layer is explicitly on top of uh, its neighbor so um, if I draw like if I'm on this layer and I draw this yellow on top of it um, the yellow is on top of uh, the last green stroke that I did. Whereas if I now go in here, go in with some of that, uh, the opposite is true. So that way I never know 
if this will work, but now if I lower the opacity, you'll see that all those strokes overlap. So you can't necessarily control um, the intensity of this with uh, the opacity here. So to show you how layers override this, let's just make another layer. Put some purple in here. I think I've just got a occasional pen pressure bug. So this layer in the layer stack is on top. Now it's on the bottom. Uh, so a layer overrides Z depth, in other words. And then like the last thing that comes into play is how in front or behind things are. So I think the last thing I'm gonna do is maybe Let's just be a little lighter and a little less saturated. sort of patterny stuff is a great way to like give yourself a secondary layer of stuff so for instance if I do something like there we just know that there's like a spot that maybe got stuck under a fat fold So like, I think like the things you have to watch out for with grease pencil and animation is like every extra layer of complexity can either um, make it so you're solving a problem, but it can also become the problem. So like, I think everyone at some point has experienced like layer soup or node soup, or it's just too hard to um, keep up. Just doing a little cleanup right there. And it's better to like over erase, in my opinion, than under erase. Because you're like constantly, I don't know, once you've drawn it, you get so worried about wasting it. And I think it's important to come to terms with that potential. And so, like, the only way I can fix this is by erasing it. Now when I go to the local color layer, you can draw in with some purple. Where's nasty eyes? So one last thing I guess before we go is um, yeah. where do you 
take this from here. I think uh, one thing that I oftentimes will then struggle with, oh yeah, I love the way things look with no line layer on. We can go up here, there's some hotkey for it, which is insert blank keyframe. So I'm gonna go through and do this on everything that needs a keyframe. So lines, good. Shadow, control R. I already forgot it. Shift R. Local color, shift R. Actually, you know what? Maybe I don't need to do that. Maybe all I need is this fill layer to have it. Because, since that determines the opacity of everything else, boom, instant solution. Uh, but you can already see like why it's useful to separate out flats is Flats are, you know, I think like a lot of stuff like this, you know, I just kept a lot of my lines on one layer, the background something on another layer. But a lot of times, you know, especially when you're trying to get frames out really fast, you just do all that stuff on one layer. And flats are your opportunity to like create that Z depth after the fact. Put this too, too dark. Anyways, I gotta be getting close on time. So, yeah. Uh, I hope this was fun for you, and uh, happy World Blender Meetup Day.